Hi everyone, welcome to the, the latest in the Green Transport Recovery Series from Landor Links um, webinar series of, of various things. There's a couple more next week I know of. Um, today we're talking about from pop-up to permanent, looking at active travel as the new normal. It's sponsored by Ready Weld, who've been putting in some of the um, equipment and we'll hear from them later. So we're, I'm Mark Strong, I'm here down in Brighton, which um, I've got to put in a plug for being the first uh, authority in the country to put in an emergency measure on the 20th, uh, 20th of April on Madeira Drive, which I was part of the team helping to get that put in, um, and also one of the first pop-up cycle lanes in the country, so quite proud of doing that. And I'm sure we'll be doing hearing more from Brighton in the near future. Um, but we're first of all going to hear from Lester, who have been very um, active over the years, um, putting in putting in facilities generally, but also on their key worker corridor. And um, so over to Councillor Adam Clark, Deputy Mayor of Leicester, um, who will be talking about the issues that they've been facing and the, the rapid response they've been doing. Thanks very much. Thanks ever so much, Mark, and uh, hi, everybody. Um, real pleasure to be able to talk to you this morning. Um, as Mark said, we um, installed the Key Worker Corridor, which was the first cycleway, uh, pop up cycleway in the country, and we really did get uh, a response that we would not have imagined from that both within the city in terms of uh, promoting uh, safe cycling for key workers um, but also uh, around the country um, and actually globally uh, mainly through the um, uh, a report from Forbes that um, was taken up internationally. Um, the guy I hope you can see on your screen there is is Craig Glynn Smith. He's become a bit of an internet sensation since um, since we tweeted that image. Um, and that really, that scheme, that initial scheme that we, on, on, on day one of lockdown, we realized we had an opportunity to do something quickly there. Um, and the response to that has given us huge confidence to move at great pace um, in, in delivering more schemes. There's no doubt that we live in extraordinary times. COVID-19 has taken a, a huge toll on society. It's, it's taken lives, separated families and communities. It shocked our economy and, and halted everyday activities and interactions, but plans for a stage return to relative normality um, are now being prepared. And we've really probably been preparing um, since since lockdown, as I've, as I've said. Um, an, an uplift in transport activity is going to present real challenges for transportation everywhere. And, and in Leicester, that is um, that, you know, that challenge is no less. But first and foremost, we we really need to develop um, uh, a response that prevents infection and that's got to be our absolute priority but beyond this we've got an unprecedented uh, unprecedented opportunity i guess to change permanently people's everyday travel behavior and that's the uh, you know that's the real challenge that we're, we're that we're facing and we're embracing so we're really keen to encourage sustainable transport choices for the environment for our health uh, for the economy and for our own personal pockets as well. If you want to skip on it on a slide, please do. Uh, the, the image you can see there is the second is the second pop-up cycle lane gone in there with the, the newly in introduced uh, stencils. Um, this is London Road, which um, uh, runs from uh, the county border um, right the way through to um, some very new permanent infrastructure that went in that goes right into our city centre past our railway station uh, that went in uh, maybe a couple of months before before the crisis started. Uh, so we've developed um, a, a transport recovery plan which we're actually publishing um, hopefully today. We're just trying to find one final image and then it's going to get published. Um, and that transport recovery plan ref reflects our um, our approach try to develop some high level principles, those being sustainability, social equity, and of course, safety. So everything we do must put safety first. Um, we want safe design, we want safe um, safety in terms of social distancing, but also safety in terms of preventing um, those negative health outcomes that, um, that motor transport can, can, can um, lead to and, and that active travel can prevent. <clears throat> in terms of sustainability, there's obviously the climate emergency, um, there's, but there's also the sustainability of our economy as well that we're keen to, that, you know, that we're keen to ensure 
Um, and then social equity is, is really key. So making sure that we are leading by example in terms of our duties under, under the Equalities Act um, and making sure that the, uh, the city is as inclusive as possible. So those three pillars are really helping us to communicate what we want to do going forward and really do reflect what, what we try and do in any case in our permanent um, infrastructure. Um, programs through what's known as the Connecting Leicester program. You can skip on again. And skip on again. That's just a close up of our stencil that's gone in. And that's the, the county border where the London Road pop up cycle lane starts, um, quite uh, serendipitously outside an old tram depot, because um, that was the that was where the tram route once uh, began um, in, from the south of the city into the city centre. And take us on again. I've been really keen when I've been discussing the um, the program we've initiated that whilst the the visual um, impact of pop up infrastructure is really strong and um, and resonates, it doesn't work without its bedfellow of behaviour change. And the work we've been doing to promote behavior change in terms of working with organizations like Sustrans, um, but also giving out bikes, free loan bikes to key workers and others um, uh, uh, have just helped us to, to really kind of embed the messages that we want to do. And we've been overwhelmed by the amount of bikes we've given out and also the free bike fixes. We've been able to fund our independent bike shops to, to deliver. So if you want to skip on again, I'll come back to our program going forward. This, um, this is a Google map that just that, that we developed incredibly quickly, um, pretty much as soon as the key worker corridor went in. And that looks at where we feel we can deliver uh, pop up cycling infrastructure and uh, pavement widening um, programs. So what we what we've got there is a, a range of pro a range of schemes, some of which um, are actually funded for permanent um, uh, for, 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 for permanent schemes over the next few years, particularly through the Transforming Cities Fund. Some of them um, are um, are planned. So we've got drawings worked up. Um, some of them we have wanted to put in for for, for a long time, um, but for all sorts of reasons haven't been haven't been able to, um, such as the Belgrave Road pavement widening scheme on our on our Golden Mile. We can now put in a pop up scheme and demonstrate to residents and businesses the you know the impact that that will have um, across those three pillars that I mentioned before, those three principles of sustainability, social equity, and safety. So what you so what you can see there is um, a kind of hybrid of pop-up and permanent schemes um, that, that that we'll be able to deliver in pop-up form initially, and hopefully move to the permanent schemes where we see that, um, that, that, that those improvements that we're aiming for. So Mark and, and everyone, I, hopefully um, that gives gives a really good overview of, of what we are, are doing in, in the city. Um, from a political level, of, um, overwhelmingly, there's been incredibly positive response to the work we've been doing. Um, in, in addition to, to the, um, uh, you know, the, the the behavior change stuff and being able to give out bikes and fix bikes and give people helmets and lights um, uh, and work with Sustrans on route planning and such like, we couldn't have done it without an embedded culture within the local authority. We didn't just decide overnight that um, we were able to do this. We had to have the culture within the authority. I think it helps that we have, have, have a mayor in the city. I think it helps that we have a particular mayor in the city and Peter Salisbury who really gets this and is deeply passionate about this work. Um, and, and I also think it helps that we that, that we have a really fantastic cycling community in the city who can spread positive, positive messages um, through, through, through our networks too. So um, if you want to skip on again. These are our next steps, um, continuing with Bike Aid, continuing with connect Connecting Leicester, publishing our recovery plan um, in the next couple of hours, I hope. We're committed to delivering one mile a week now over at least the next 10 weeks of cycling and walking infrastructure, more key worker corridors, more wider footways more cycle tracks and then um, uh, the cherry on the cake will be our Santander cycle scheme um, in the summer um, which again we hope will help to to put Leicester further on the map in this work. Thank you very much for listening I hope I've not taken too much of your time Mark I've not really been watching the clock um, I will uh, I'll leave it there and look forward to answering any questions later.
Adam, you've been fine. That's exactly the, you know, you've had exactly the right amount of time. So I don't think there's a problem with that. We've had to change um, the order slightly because uh, Dr. Bob Davis is having problems getting hold of uh, getting online at the moment. So we switched around. So the next speaker is going to be Alex Longdon uh, from TfL Transport for London, who I've worked with in the past on the strategic cycling analysis. Um, and I know that TfL are doing an enormous amount and indeed all the London boroughs on this. So I'm very interested to see what's, what's happening in London right now. So over to Alex and thanks for switching around at the last minute. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks for the introduction. Um, as Mark said, I've worked uh, on a range of cycling and walking projects um, over the past few years. And what's been really um, interesting um, about the last few months is working on the same stuff, but with um, a, a hugely burning, urgent burning platform and trying to, to do a lot of the, the work that we've done um, been doing over the last few years, but at, at hyperspeed. Um, so it's been challenging, but but also rewarding. And as we've seen from um, from Adam's presentation, stuff is getting rolled out really quickly, and that's just so exciting to see all those photos um, coming in from around London and around the country. Um, so I'm I'm going to talk a bit about the Street Space Plan, which is London's response to the the global pandemic, and in particular our response to the challenge of restarting our city as the lockdown eases and recovering from from the, the dreadful and unprecedented situation which we find ourselves in and i really want to use this slot to get under the skin of why we're doing this and how we're working to plan a coherent and effective set of measures in a city of london's size and complexity so um, looking at this slide what is the street space plan it's about urgently reconsidering how we use our street space to make sure that Londoners are able to move around the city and use London's streets and places in a safe, green and healthy way. It involves a whole range of different measures from rolling out a strategic network of pop-up cycle routes to increasing footway space in busy locations to aid with social distancing and queuing to delivering school streets and low traffic neighbourhoods to lock in the reduced levels of traffic that we've seen during the lockdown. And all this is cited in a, a broader approach to restart and recovery that will require a whole range of measures, including travel demand management, and as Adam mentioned, behaviour change measures, um, such as uh, uh, measures like clearer customer information and, and more cycle parking. So moving on to the next slide, why are we doing this? Well, as we come out of the lockdown, London's going to face some really significant challenges. We're going to have to run public transport at a much lower capacity if we're going to continue to provide space for social distancing on those services. And we're going to have to contend with the car being a much more attractive choice for a lot of Londoners. And if we do nothing, we're likely to see a car based recovery. And that's going to mean um, increased road danger. It's going to impact um, public health. Um, by making it harder for people to walk and cycle, by reducing air quality. Um, it will hurt London's economic recovery. It will slow down essential freight and servicing journeys if more people are driving. And it will make town centres unpleasant and unsafe places to be. Um, and obviously it will, will harm the uh, climate um, emergency, which continues to be a, a pressing challenge. And um, give us the, the wrong platform to deliver the mayor's transport strategy, which is our long term ambition for 2041. So it's really, really clear that a car based um, recovery is, is, is not something that London can afford to see. And just moving on to the next slide, um, we can see some analysis that we've we've done there um, about both the challenge, but also the opportunity. So that first map shows um, where we would see increases in um, car journeys if people who are using public transport at the minute started to drive instead. Um, but I guess flipping that on its head in the second map, we can see where we would see huge increases in active travel travel if public transport journeys starts to be walk and cycled instead. So that really kind of brings um, the scale of the challenge um, forward. But I think it's important to remember that those maps are just based on current patterns of mobility. We also need to think about how those patterns will evolve and change and what's needed to ensure that those new patterns are not shaped by car travel. I think that's going to be really important in, in outer London, where we might see um, less journeys made into the, the central core. 
the next slide um, sets out some of the, the benefits of the measures we're implementing, both the, the immediate public uh, health imperatives, um, enabling social distancing on street, giving Londoners a genuine alternative um, to public transport that isn't driving, um, but also how the plan starts um, building those pathways to the medium term recovery and where we want to take our city in the long term, um, supporting health and well-being, um, giving us the opportunity to improve um, public transport as capacity can be, be dialed up, um, supporting London's economic regeneration, supporting our local high streets and town centres, um, and thinking about how this can be part of a transition towards uh, more use of um, cycle freight. Moving on to the next slide, um, yeah, we, we uh, this this slide, uh, the next two slides show some of the um, analysis um, that we've done to support the street space plan. And I thought I, I, I put this in the slide because um, obviously transport for London is doing a lot on its own roads, but. Uh, as you'll know, if you've attended any webinar um, with a TfL speaker, TfL only control 5% of London's roads and the remaining 95% um, are managed by the boroughs. So we need to work together with London's boroughs to make sure that um, we're coming up and we're providing a coherent um, set of measures that um, provide Londoners um, with um, ways to travel around the city. So this is our temporary strategic cycling analysis. We've got a storied history in London of, of um, using data to um, lead the way for our cycle planning. Um, and what we've done is very rapidly analyze data about where public transport journeys are being made um, and putting those public transport journeys that can be shifted to cycling onto our street network to understand where we might see increases in cycling and where we're going to need new infrastructure. So we're using this analysis to shape our own plans We've also shared it with Boris um, to make sure that we're planning towards a single coherent network. And then the, the final slide is another piece of analysis, which I think um, kind of underlines the need to think more broadly um, in the face of this, this crisis and our response to it than just the traditional transport um, thinking and traditional transport arguments. So um, that's essentially a map of um, potential low traffic neighborhoods and also London's parks. So um, what we can see is there are lots of residential areas that don't have um, close access, easy access to a park. And we've got to think about how the people living there can have access to safe, car-free outside space that's important for their physical and their mental well-being. So this starts to point towards where we and boroughs might implement those low traffic neighbourhoods, not just in terms of keeping traffic down and, and sort of locking in active travel, but giving people access to, to green spaces. Um, so that's kind of a, a, an overview of the street space plan and some of the uh, principles and thinking that we're using to help identify and prioritise um, measures and how we're working together with the boroughs um, to do that. Thanks very much. That's that's brilliant, Alex, and thanks very much for that. And it's really interesting, especially right at the end, to hear about the um, uh, the residential areas because I think there's been a lot of focus on on key worker corridors, rightly so. But, but residential areas seem to have uh, dropped off the agenda a bit. Um, so it's quite interesting. We're still having problems with Bob Davis. Hopefully, we can bring him uh, along um, before the end. But we'll switch over now to Jeanette Holder from ReadyWeld Traffic Products. Uh, and ReadyWeld have been doing some of the temporary um, infrastructure, physical infrastructure measures that have been used to create some of the pop-up lanes. And I'm sure we'll hear all about that now. Thanks very much, Jeanette. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, yes, as, you, as Mark has said, we've been involved heavily with a lot of the infrastructure that's being put in very quickly. Um, and I just want to give you a little bit of background of who we are as, as ReadyWeld. Uh, next slide, please. So we're, we're a UK manufacturer. Uh, we're based in Alton and Hampshire. Um, for us as a manufacturer, it means that we can adapt quickly to demand that we see in the marketplace. So with these new measures that we are now seeing and the challenges that we're facing with the COVID-19 and trying to make the public safe, um, we're able to ramp up our production to be able to offer uh, materials quickly and effectively out onto the network. 
obviously with the increase of cycling and walking that we've seen over the last few few weeks with everybody being in lockdown it's been great um, but obviously challenges in itself um, and obviously these measures are looking to be implemented in in, in weeks uh, compared to months um, we've manufactured our products from 100% recycled rubber material and we have processes in place with low energy processes uh, which help our carbon footprint so by offering an environmental product uh, we are obviously trying to help the environment uh, as, a, as a company as well the products we offer are permanent but they can be used for temporary solutions which is what you're seeing a lot on the network now but if these areas work really well then they can be left as permanent solutions um, so you do have that flexibility quick and easy to install um, no excavation no spoil and because the benefit of the quick and easy installation is basically you're reducing risk for any operatives that are out on site um, especially with the current situation trying to keep them risk free um, from, from trying to reduce you know catching uh, covid so you know there's lots of things that we take measures of uh, next slide please so I said we we use uh, environmental the product we use is uh, treadings and it's um, when the tires are uh, retreaded so it's the very best rubber that we actually have and um, we process up to about 20 tons a week of recycled material but obviously if we see a huge demand in the market like we're seeing at the moment then obviously that is that is more usage um, and uh, we are very conscious about obviously the environmental aspect of what we do with our products and the way that we manufacture. Uh, next slide please so with all these measures um the social distancing measures that we have seen um a lot of these measures have been introduced with tro's traffic regulation orders offering temporary experimental and permanent measures um, this is obviously being done by incorporating lining uh, removing parking parking bays changing advisory lanes to mandatory as part of the traffic and uh, traffic sign and regulations act and obvious other areas being um, uh, implemented under temporary and experimental works such as suspending car parking bays to create new space road closures and speed restrictions uh, next slide please areas of potential risk are being identified by local authorities uh, where the public are obviously where they're most at risk um, so typical uh, areas like they get a bottleneck of pedestrian movement these can be outside uh, tube stations where you get a gathering um, areas where you have um, narrow pavements causing a bottleneck bus stop areas where people are waiting um, so obviously you need to create wider pavements or perhaps introduce the splitting uh, of bus stops to create more space uh, we're seeing uh, areas obviously narrowing pavement so widening pavements to provide better movement and obviously trying to make sure that we're not pushing uh, pedestrians into areas where there are traffic uh, into into the road uh, or where they're cyclists uh, high volume areas um, so obviously where there's restrictions for cyclists and this is where you would see your pop-up cycle lanes being introduced and obviously we we're seeing now that uh, shortly the shops and pubs and restaurants will be starting to open again and obviously there's going to be areas there which will need to to be looked at in terms of reducing risk uh, next slide please so as as the um as alex has said uh, there's been already lots of met methods uh, introduced so far we've seen various products being implemented from cones various barrier solutions um, we've been involved with our ready curb hp curbing uh, which has been used to create widen widen of pavements um, it's been used at park lane to create a, a build out for bus stop uh, the jizzle on one pole cones the black and white pole cones that you see they're being installed to create a delineation of lanes to create space uh, splitter islands and obviously many other products uh, out there as well at the moment next slide please so the, scheme, the first scheme that uh, we were involved with um, that happened within a 24 hour period was the Brixton scheme. Um, this is one of uh, TFL's very quick um, scheme that went in. Uh, we offered here our curbing 
uh, which provided the ideal solution for creating this additional space to widen the paved pavement. Uh, this is outside Brixton uh, tube station. Um, it was uh, installed overnight, um, quick and easy, and then infilled with asphalt um, to, to finish it off. The curbs that we offer are available in black or grey, and you have the option of having with or without the white markings, which is a reflective material moulded in at time of manufacture. Uh, we can incorporate um, drainage channels with the product so that if there's areas, because you're building in addition to the existing pavement, you've got to then think about drainage, drainage channels, um, manhole covers and things like that. So we've, we've been in discussions with a lot of authorities about those type of measures in addition to, to our product as well. And what was really nice about this location, because um, obviously there was a lot of uh, social media about this first location, was that the residents reclaimed the street afterwards the next day and obviously decorated the area, which was really nice to see that, you know, utilising that new space, um, it was really nice to, to actually see. Right, next slide. Another scheme that you've seen is the pop-up cycle lane in Park Lane. Uh, this is a, a new product that we've produced. It uh, works very well um, with our Greenwich One Dorker range, range product. Um, so compared to having a, a longer le length of product incorporated with the pole cones, this is a standalone one metre section and can be evenly spaced along the road, making a cost effective um, solution and obviously um, yeah, it um, offers vertical and horizontal measures for high visibility at night. It's got 3M material on the pole cone, so it, they are very, very bright. They're very quick and easy to put in, and, and as most of you are aware, the, the ski went in again overnight, um, working closely with our, the contractor, which was Ringway Jacobs. Uh, they did a great job, um, and we've seen so much, again, media press on this particular location, um, and it was lovely to see Jeremy Vine uh, riding along it yesterday on a penny penny farthing, um, enjoying enjoying the new space, um, which is uh, again it, it it's it's things like that that really sort of hone what we're trying to achieve in terms of creating space, making the public safe, giving more space, getting more to people to be active, um, and it, yeah, it's really nice to see. Um, next slide, please. So just to summarise, um, so as a, an innovative and UK manufacturer, um, we we try to react to the current demand and the, the market is very key to how we act as a company. Because we are a manufacturer, uh, we can adapt and obviously enhance and quickly offer our products um, by and speaking to our customers, partners, engineers, planners, you know, we can try and see what, what what's actually required in the marketplace, what people are actually requiring, how they want to, to implement these products uh, so that we can act as a, as a company. Our Orca range has grown extensively over four years and, and this has been greatly appreciated by discussing various solutions and things with, with our customers um, and obviously adapting to different widths and lengths because we know that one product isn't ideal for every location and a lot of people don't have the space. Uh, we don't have, some people have the option, you know, outside of London, they have a lot more space, but in London and, you know, areas, you don't have the flexibility of being able to use wider products. So we've had to adapt in that market as well. Um, and just to let you know, there is our brochure and um, temporary cycle product PDFs in the uh, handout section. So if you would like to download those, uh, please, uh, please feel free um, and look forward to answer any questions in the Q&A section. Thank you very much. Jeanette, thanks very much for that. Um, it, it does look very much like we're not going to get Bob, so um, apologies for, for that. Um, I don't know um, whether that's going to change, um, so we can move straight on to the questions. Um, I'll just spend a couple of minutes myself just um, pointing out that um, for, for authorities, well, both inside and outside London, they've all now got an announcement from the DFT in the last 24 hours with an amount of money um, telling them how much allocation they've got and giving them four weeks to actually introduce some measures and they've got to be put in within eight weeks. And some councils have got quite significant amounts of funding. 
it's going to be a challenge to those councils to actually bring the resources to bear to actually deliver things and places like Leicester I think are going to be um, very much at the forefront of being able to deliver that quickly anyone who's already got uh, measures in place or proposals in place will be um, quick and able to deliver things and others may have a, a challenge in that time. So I'll move on to the questions now and take myself off the webcam. Um, there's a variety of questions and if I can field them, uh, I've started by answering them. So I'll answer one that came from Robin Field first, if I may, myself, because, um, but I think get, get, get answers from, from certainly from Adam, I think. So the presentations have all been about infrastructure and um, isn't this the time to address the driving culture and other things as well? And I think that is a good question, but <clears throat> maybe not a question for this session, because we're actually looking at uh, specific measures. But um, maybe Alex and Adam, you, you, if you could answer that quickly, that would be quite interesting. Hi, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting point. And I think um, one, you know, sort of more broadly, um, you know, with the, with the lockdown and the recovery from the lockdown, um, what we've, we, we, we've got the opportunity to do is um, people have the opportunity to think very differently about the spaces they use, about transport. Transport is kind of top of the policy agenda in a way uh, that it hasn't been for, for a very long time. So I think what we do now um, will define the pathways that we take towards kind of the recovery in the longer term uh, transport future. And I think there's uh, you know, you, the question makes the point that everyone knows what two meters is now. I think, um, you know, there's loads of ways where people are going to think differently about um, transport and streets and how can we um, build on that and capture that as we, we build those pathways um, towards that green recovery. That's brilliant. We are now have got Bob, so if we could... I switch, we'll come back to the rest of the questions, which are specifically on public measures. Um, but if we can now get Bob in, thanks very much for joining us, Bob, and um, over to you. Sorry you've missed the other presentations, but um, we've got about seven minutes, so if you can go ahead, that's great. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, terribly sorry, everybody. Uh, that <laughs> I've just spent three quarters of an hour on my hands and knees trying to deal with uh, various internet problems, which I normally don't get. Okay, so uh, here's my take on what's been happening. Uh, first slide, please. Um, basically, uh, sorry, go back to first slide. Uh, yeah, if you can have a look at that first link, that's uh, a, a long piece I wrote for RDRF on what we should be doing and why. And there are updates every week, which I do on Brian Deegan's ideas with B as uh, web uh, Zoom session, and uh, you can see them on YouTube. They uh, are all on uh, our website. Okay, next slide. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is, I mean, you know, we've got fantastic news. The letters that had come out yesterday with the instructions demanding that people do things, uh, although, of course, we don't have enough money to do everything we want to. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is more about how you engage with members, other officers, campaigning groups, how you take part in the, the, the kind of um, ideological struggle, if you like. Um, and I'm suggesting that we have to be prepared to justify road space reallocation um, not just because we've been told to by the government, but uh, because we will come up against uh, various obstacles from uh, local, some local residents, some members, uh, and some officers. Uh, so we have to refer to the government instructions, but explain the background. So you should know about all the negatives of our current status quo. Amanda. Um, uh, health disbenefits to users, uh, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, the space consumption argument, very important. Talk about the external costs uh, of uh, motoring from all those things and other things. Um, and uh, uh, say, why should drivers be bailed out? Um, because that's what we're doing. Uh, so be aware of all those arguments. Next slide, please. 
Okay, lovely graphic from Dave Walker at Cycling. That's what we're on about. Next graphic, next slide, please. Uh, be aware of the local campaigns, uh, the Mums for Lungs in London, the uh, campaign for key workers to get access to hospitals, the Cycling UK study, and do make sure you've written to councils uh, and you keep the, the pressure on, the information on for members. Next slide. Yeah, you see, it's about a struggle for space. And uh, 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 so what I used in this slide was from, from the excellent Jeremy Vine. Do have a look at his Twitter feed. He talks a lot about things. And here he's saying, a few days ago, saying, Here's Hammersmith Council in London putting up a, a good pop-up bike lane. That's great. But you can see it gets narrow around there. And then further on, there's the, the guy is coming in too close to the curb, gets into a conflict with the van there. So we need wider lanes. We need engineering throughout. Uh, and it's all about who gets what space. And it's a political with both a small P and a big P struggle. Next slide, please. So here's a, a, a good bit of road space reallocation in Kingston on Thames in London on Kingston Bridge. Um, little bit of concern about how the new COVID-19 signage, which you'll be using, uh, is actually causing a bit of a problem for pedestrians. So, you know, that has to be looked at a bit, but uh, it's a minor problem. What I'm really interested in this slide is that you've seen that the pedestrians get the space of the former cycle lane. So because you've got this great big of tree curbing, where a cyclist going to go? They have to have the cycle lane on the carriageway. And that's the kind of road space reallocation that we want to see, where you're getting serious space properly reallocated. Don't forget the latest letters talk about the need to change the transport status quo. Something like that is doing this. You know, may need to have um, more kind of solid barriers than just cones, but that's the thing was what we need to be talking about, and we need to be able to justify it in terms of what I was talking about before. Okay, next slide. Yeah, you know the things, bicycle, bingo, you don't pay tax, you didn't take a, a test, you're breaking the law, you fall off your bike, it's a strain on the NHS. All, all these kind of things need to be fought. And it'll be quite a profound level because people think that they have a special right to be out there in cars because they pay vehicle excise duty or they drove properly once for 20 minutes when um, uh, they took their driving test and that cyclists are more dangerous and cause congestion. And you have to go through these arguments and it will freak out a lot of people, but you do actually have to do that. You have to do that with your members. If you're a councillor, you have to do it with other councillors. Uh, you have to say you're instructed to make change by government, but you have to make it absolutely clear why you're doing it and why you need to do it in uh, a way which makes fundamental changes. Okay, so that is about six minutes. Um, I think that's about it from me in terms of my presentation, and I'm happy to take questions and hope to join in the discussion. Hello, go on here, people. Uh, you're muted, Mark.
Uh, it seems that Mark uh, yeah. Mark Strong is muted and can't unmute. Um, Mark, perhaps you could have a look in your control panel there um, and just uncheck the the mute button. Um, until he does that, I, I don't mind asking a, a few questions to the panel if that's okay. Um, unless you're okay now, Mark? No. Okay, so. Um, Let's just have a look. We've had lots of questions come in, so thanks very much for that. Uh, it's Daniel Simpson here, by the way, from Landor. Um, thanks for everyone's questions coming in. Um, uh, there was a good question that came in from uh, Lembit Opic, uh, former uh, MP. What impact assessments has been made about the increased accident risk for motorcyclists from installed road obstructions and reduced road space? both already highlighted by the Motorcycle Action Group, MAG. Also, why are you not focusing on promoting motorcycle usage as a COVID-19 resistance travel solution um, with PPE, while by contrast, cyclists persistently violate the two meter rule? Does anyone want to pick that up? Uh, quickie, yeah. Go for yeah. it, Robert. Uh, I'd say that the evidence shows that motorcycling uh, has some, uh, one of the highest rates of involvement with pedestrian casualties, uh, below lorries, but above cars uh, and certainly above bicycles. Um, it's also uh, the most hazardous form of transport, although I don't see that as an argument against motorcycling because I'm in favour of people being able to hurt themselves. Um, it doesn't have the health benefits of cycling and it has problems with noxious emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. But I don't take what um, road safety people would be that you know you want to restrict motorcycling uh, because of its hazards to the riders themselves and I think problems that motorcyclists face from uh, other motorised road users, principally car and van users, should be dealt with by high levels of enforcement and deterrent sentencing. I, I think okay. I'm back now, so can you all hear me now? Yes, go for it, Mark. You, you're going to have to put up with the road noise from my supposedly 20 mile an hour road outside. Um, so I'm going to switch on to um, Anna Semlin's uh, question about 20 mile an hour limits and, and, and Possibly Alex is going to be dealing with that one about um, trying to have um, extend 20 mile an hour. It's Kensington and Chelsea, it says here, has just reduced a, a speed limit reduction. But is there plans to look at that across the whole of London rather than just um, borough by borough? Yes. Yeah, so um, we, you know, one of the stark realities we've seen during the lockdown is more speeding. I think um, people might have seen some some sort of eye-watering um, figures for um, people exceeding the speed limits on, on certain roads. And um, looking at reducing speed limits um, was part of our long-term approach pre-COVID. I think it's definitely part of our approach to, um, to the restart. So for instance, um, on Park Lane, we installed uh, a new temporary cycle lane, which um, Jeanette showed us. Um, we also took the opportunity to reduce the speed limit there to 20 miles an hour. Um, and it's great to hear that, that Boris are looking at as well. Um, Jeanette, is, any of your measures can be used as, as traffic calming measures as opposed to actually proper facilities. Have you got those as well? Oh, yeah, uh, we cover a full range of different types of variety of, of products. So, yeah, I mean, we, we get involved with a lot of 20 mile an hour zones. Uh, like, like we do different vertical, could have vertical measures or pinch points and things like that. So um there's different types of options uh, that we can we can help in, in that sense as well whether it's from sort of having uh, islands to create the chicane sort of aspect or uh, a road cushion or a table or something like that um it really depends on what type of application wants to be implemented to help reduce speed so uh, mo moving on to similar issues from that is really what about the impacts of this on, on other road users? Um, we heard about motorcyclists earlier, but, but also the impact particularly on pedestrians. Um, Bob was talking about um, why, you know, the, having to put cycling on the carriageway or cycle 
provision on the carriageway, but also crossing points have this impact on crossing points for pedestrians and generally the, the need to do an Equality Act um, assessment. Adam, I don't know if that's something you could answer. I, I can't get a webcam of you, but I think you're still there. So um, if, you, if you've got some ideas of yeah. how less to look at pedestrians' impacts. So um, at the outset uh, of, of the crisis, probably before the key worker corridor went in, we changed the timings on our on our crossings um, to you know to promote that to, to, to promote safety and to promote pedestri pedestrians there. Um, in terms of uh, kind of joining the two questions together, really, if we're temporarily widening footways as we are in our in, in our neighbourhood shopping areas, um, we're also slowing traffic there and putting in advisory 20 mile an hour zones immediately um and you know and hoping to move forward to make those permanent where you know where, where it seems fit to do that so i think by by creating space for active travel you, you, you are going to slow speeds of other other traffic down in any case that's a you know that, that's a symptom of the of the work that we're doing and in terms of the actual negative impacts that you know people can't necessarily cross if there's some things in the way are you uh, i presume you're looking at in every site in detail to see that to make sure that that isn't happening yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it, 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 in terms of um, yeah, whether whether maybe barriers to to crossing um, cycleways particularly, absolutely. But we're keeping you know we're keeping um, bus stops free and we're keeping crossings free to enable that there and making sure that you know you know nothing is um, compromised um, in terms of active travel. We're not compromising one form of active travel to promote another form of active travel. That's certainly part of the, the social equity um, element. I could, can I just come on to um, where, where we go beyond this? We're, we're about to publish a street design guide and I came up with four S's earlier, the sustainability, social equity and safety, which is really to help me remember what we're talking about, have those, those three S's, sorry. The fourth S is, um, is about streetscape, and it is about making sure you've got that an, an attractive streetscape um, moving beyond what isn't necessarily the most attractive infrastructure. You'll see pictures of cones on on um, on, on my slideshow. We are looking to move on to onto ones, as we saw on Jeanette's um, show, but also um, we really want to make sure that um, we've got a streetscape that's that's welcoming beyond that, and that'll come forward in our street design guide that we're publishing publishing next week, um, and really promoting those, um, those, those those active travel movements without without compromising one for the other. Bob, I don't know if you've got any any takes on on the impact on other other road users, particularly cycling and particularly walking. Um, I think, you know, the main thing is that, that what we have to do is make it clear we're on part of a serious modal shift trajectory, okay? And it's going to be difficult. Not everybody's going to get everything that they want. And it's being done very quickly with not enough money. Um, so it, it, it's a tricky one. And some things are really just not going to be as correct as they can for everybody. I mean, for me, the main thing about pedestrians is to get speeds down. And also you will require um, uh, serious law enforcement in terms of dealing not just with the ultra speeders that we've seen during lockdown, lockdown but with the ordinary common or garden uh, rule breaking, which is uh, primarily from motor vehicle users uh, uh endangering pedestrians i think those are the main things and you will get that through the kind of things that i assume you've been talking about low traffic neighborhoods uh footway extensions and pop-up cycle lanes and um you know i i think we really have to crack on with that as much as possible and the important thing is if we can use the kind of thing that the materials that jeanette's been talking about um to actually make that kind of transformation that's really the more important thing than than thinking about having a kind of sort of you know, pretty looking environment in my view i think one of the things worth noting by the way is the guidance from the government that came out yesterday explicitly says don't um, waste time on pretty looking stuff get things that work then yes. make it look beautiful in the, in the long term. Absolutely, Most yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that, one thing I, ask, <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask Jeanette about is I have heard whispers that a lot of, of, of the uh, temporary materials 
are beginning to run out. I mean, I don't know if there's anything you can tell us about that, Jeanette. Um, well, as as uh, most people and other companies are probably having the same effect, uh, yes, so uh, we are having huge amounts of inquiries, which is fantastic. However, um, we are we have increased our production um, uh, to meet the new demands, but there are only limitations to to what we can make it within the the time that we're now having to to implement very quickly. So there are going to be a time where we're going to get to a point where we are going to have to look at perhaps longer lead times than, than we particularly like because we can't keep up with the demand. Um, I mean, we are talking thousands of products. So, you know, it's not like 50, 30 here and there. It's it's big volume. And um, as a company, we are reacting to the best we can to, to, to increase in, in what we're doing. Uh, we're going to look at some double shifts as well um, to, to try and help what we've got on the books and with inquiries that we're seeing. Um, we have um, the, the the ones obviously is a is a key product, um, and uh, mm -hmm. we've got product that's being made and uh, that's going to be in transit uh, coming over uh, July as well. So um, it, it's one of those balances. It's just trying to be able to offer and supply everybody that's wanting these products effectively and quickly as we can. But, um, you know, we're just being upfront and, and giving exact lead times. We've got a production plan in place, uh, making sure that we can try and commit to all the demand that we're seeing. So it's a challenge in itself for us. Um, we like challenges, but um, we, we, we're up for it and we'll see how we go. Good, so. Alex, um, <clears throat> what are the, one of the, um, Things about TfL, obviously, is you're possibly the biggest purchaser of these sort of things in the country. I mean, possibly Highways England might be bigger, but you must have a stock, or TfL and the boroughs must have a huge stock of temporary materials already in the work of Michael Barrett in the past at doing this sort of thing. So is there a case of, uh, of uh, are you taking cones off one site and putting them on another or redistributing stuff that you've already got somewhere else? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'm afraid I'm not close enough to the um, delivery side of things to know if we've got a warehouse of cones um, anywhere. Uh, I, I know for a fact that here in... Le oh. Sorry, Mark, can I come in? Go on, yes. Uh, in, I know for a fact here in Leicester, we put in a, an order for 2,000 cones and then up that to 6,000 and have a, an, an order in for a lot of ones that went in very early. So apologies from Leicester if other authorities are, are struggling. We, um, our, our process is to, is, to, is to incrementally replace cones with ones and move those cones um, mm. over to the next scheme um, and, and, and to have a kind of rolling program in, in that sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, I joke that I would have liked to have seen the head of highways um, basket at checkout on Amazon when he put in his order for those cones. Well, interestingly enough, um, both Adam and I, I've got to, we've got to get this in, both Adam and I are Liverpool fans. Um, we did hear that Liverpool Council couldn't put in some of their temporary measures um, quickly enough because they had a national shortage of the water-filled barriers, not not the cones. Yeah. So it is, it, you know, uh, yeah, that, yeah. put that out as, a, as an official reason for delay. So it's not, it's not a trivial thing to say there are material problems. It is actually delaying some councils yeah. from doing things. So just moving on. Uh, one yeah, more absolutely. Question. And the market needs to respond. Moving on, I wanted to get one question in because, uh, um, which is, what is the cost of these? I mean, uh, not obviously per cone, but or per wand. But if you're putting in a kilometre of Park Lane style provision, authorities would like to know a very ballpark figure to be able to cost that. So, I mean, I don't know, if Jeanette, if that's something. I mean, without giving away your individual <laughs> trade secrets, if there's something uh, you can yeah, talk about, um, how much it really costs. <laughs> Not me on the spot, Adam. Oh, oh. oh, you're working it out for us. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're looking at covering an area, I don't know, a thousand meters or something like that. Uh, I mean, typically a wand and a, a, a one piece in a pole cone is 149 pound each. Um, so you're looking at about 149 thousand if you did a thousand meters. Um, but obviously, because you're using these products cost effectively, so you're having spacing then mm. it does make it more cost effective because you can cover a large wider area. Um, you know, it, the ones is ideal. You know, you've got the Greenwich one if you want longer uh, lengths. 
uh, splitter islands, you've got the milestone. If you want to have something a little bit more attractive, like Bob was saying, you know, the way things look is is, is very key. Um, you know, there's lots of different different ways that we can work it, but um, yeah, that's that's roughly. Um, it, it, they all vary, but obviously that's just a, a guide. And I suppose, Alan, I mean, we've been trying to get a, 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 some figures out of Will Norman for what the uh, Park Lane cost, um, because obviously there's the cost of the, the works, there's not just the cost of the materials, there's a the resource implication for the teams doing it and the traffic management issues of doing it overnight and so on. So I, I don't know, Adam, did you have a budget for yours or is that something you're not prepared to share? We've obviously, I mean, there, you know, we've obviously been looking very carefully at, at the products out there, um, and um, I don't have the figure in front of me for the for the key worker corridor, but you know, we obviously went very affordable early on because we didn't know. I mean, we were well ahead of government in terms of uh, additional funding coming forward. Um, so, and um, I, we, you know, we're relatively happy with our allocation of um, 360 odd thousand a um, couple of days ago, and that will enable us to deliver uh, um, uh, in, in, in the first stage um, what we want to. So, so, so yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the actual, how much, uh, how much the key worker cor corridor cost in terms of cones, but it was, you know, in the big scheme of things, it was, um, it, you know, it, it was limited. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you that the Brighton, the figure for Ultron Road and Brighton, which is not coned, which is a white lined, was three um, was twelve thousand to fifteen thousand pounds for three kilometres. So that was really, you know, in the scheme of things, quite peanuts. Um, Absolutely. Mo move, moving on to some of the other questions that have come up about. Um, again, I'm afraid this is going to be for Adam, but I think Alex is going to want to to answer this one as well. Um, you mentioned the key worker corridor, Adam, and you mentioned that it was in a, in a bus lane. And we've had discussions with the managing, the chief executive of the bus company here in Brighton, who is quite worried about the loss of bus priority measures in the short or longer term. Now, we know that obviously public transport use and bus use in particular is down to, let's say, 25 percent the capacity. So is the, there's definitely a fear, I think, of a sort of you know land grab from public transport. Um, and whether that will revive in the longer term. So what discussions did you have with the bus companies? We have, um, we've, we're having really positive conversations with the bus companies. I think they um, are um, much more cognizant of the concern that people might move to cars from buses than they are um, to active travel. We have, um, we have pinched bus lane, um, uh, if one of a better phrase, on, um, on, yeah, on a couple of our corridors. But we do, like I said in my presentation, we have schemes kind of in the back pocket that where we will be able to accommodate um, public as well as active active transport through that. But obviously the, the quick wins we're going for here, when you know when buses do have um, priority through the lack of motor traffic currently, um, is something that the the, you know, the bus companies are prepared to prepared to take. We obviously have a very different system in Leicester than London, so we were on a on, on a very kind of consensual positive partnership um, uh, model as we try to build a, a quality partnership with our bus operators through the the bus services act but i think because we built that positive partnership and relationship they really get what we're doing and we've done a lot of um, installation of bus priority measures bus gates 24-hour um, bus lanes etc within the city um, and supporting them to move to lower emission vehicles that um, they you know they're, they're very willing to work with us and we're willing to to make sure that they're you know that, you know, that they're not forgotten uh, and Alex I mean this obviously something right at the heart of TFL's approach is obviously the impact on buses and and you know we all know about the the impact on the revenue stream of TFL from from public transport fares being down. So is that something that has affected your streetscape or emergency streetscape plans? Yeah, just to really, I guess, echo what Adam says, it's about making sure that we avoid a car-led recovery. You know, if we have a car-led recovery, it won't be very good for active travel, but it won't be very good for buses and, and bus passengers. I think the bus is uh, a hugely important part of London's transport network. I think it will continue to be. Um, and I think we think about how we can protect uh, and support the bus network through this. So, um, for example, again, to go back to the example of Park Lane, um, we put in the temporary cycle lane, but we also took the opportunity to put in um, a bus lane alongside that. And I think that sort of traffic reduction um, approach is something we're going to have to think very, very hard about in terms of creating that space that cycling and walking are going to need for the city to um, successfully restart. Um, but also in terms of protecting the, the bus network. And um, for those of you who have read the, the DFT's um, 
letter that was sent last night, I think it's really interesting um, that that explicitly talks about um, bus and cycle only streets um, yeah. and, and how important they're going to be um, through the, uh, the lockdown. Uh, and Jeanette, obviously, Brixton is an important case of, of where you've built um, uh, bus bus stop widening, for want of a better word, pedestrian. Right. So is that something that could be done over short? Oh, that's quite a long length, wasn't it? But you presumably could just do pop, effectively pop up bus stops. Yeah, it's queuing that's going to be a real issue for buses. Yeah, for I mean the yeah the 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 one on Park Lane. Um, in one of my slides, there was a picture of the curb island that's now being formed. And that's actually a split bus stop. There's a bus stop now in the middle um, on that particular location as well. So yeah, the, the, you can do um, smaller sections. I know that um, TFL have always also been looking at um, adding some temporary bus stop uh, areas. And uh, we do a product called BusPad, which is being utilized again to help split bus stops and waiting areas, but also maintain the DDA height um, for people enabling them to get on the buses uh, safely, you know, wheelchair users and um, disabled access and that sort of thing as well. That's great because I, th I think this is, you know, this is going to be, if, if we start arguing with each other, I think it's going to be a, a big impact on, mm. on future revival. And I think, as you've all said, that, that it's going to be trying to prevent or deter a car-led car -led recovery. Um, and we also know that things like Auto Trader have been doing ads saying, "Come and buy your car." It's the only, you know, it's your own PPE. So, uh, you know, I think I think there is a risk there. Um, the smart, smart lot Sorry, go on. I was just going to say we're also looking at multimodal stuff. So we're also looking at multimodal using our park and ride sites for 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 park and cycle or for cycle and ride. Um, and so actually, and you know, and we're looking for um, park and walk around the city centre as well. So all modes are being considered, and getting the best bang for your buck out of those modes is um, uh, and looking at it in an integrated way is, is really important, I think. And I think we all need to say there is a place for the car, but not quite so many. Um, can I can I make a point, Mark? Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we also want to talk about the non-infrastructural things. I, I mentioned getting your arguments together. I think one thing I'm very keen on is that newbies or returners to cycling should get uh, actual support. Um, I ran a program in uh, London Borough of Ealing called Direct Sport for Cycling for a number of years. I don't know if it still runs. But what was done there was that you would have cycle trainers who would be available to talk on a one to one basis. This can be done socially distanced um, to uh, give basic bits and pieces of information to people who are starting out cycling. Um, there's a lot of strain on bike shops. Um, you may need as a newbie uh confidence training uh assistance with how to organize your parking at home all these kind of things which uh my understanding is that transport for london is still uh closed down the cycle training although i heard i think a couple of boroughs are doing it um it, it it's something that is often forgotten about when you're talking about infrastructure but you do need that kind of assistance mm. which is very often done by uh, local cycling campaigns, Cycling UK, the, the, the big bike revival, that sort of thing. It's all very good, but it should have uh, backup from central and local government. Um, you know we've got the 25 million for bicycle vouchers. Um, the 50 quid voucher won't necessarily take you very far with a bike that, that has been left in the back shed for 20 years. So that kind of one-to-one -one socially distanced support for people returning to cycling or getting into cycling uh, boosts their confidence and show them the basics which people who've been cycling for a while have forgotten mm. about um, mm. that is a very uh, key thing which needs to be done yeah i mean i think that's important i've also heard that bike shops are rushed off their feet and i heard from one bike sh shop owner yesterday he said i don't care how many vouchers people are throwing at me i haven't got enough staff to deal with them and you know yeah. it, it, you know so i did say you should stop recruiting people and maybe there's some job creation opportunities for people who've been furloughed there um and you know it, it is you kind know, of it, it, 
good opportunities for people to, to maybe move, have to move careers. Well, one point, this is actually uh, about the bike shops. They are under this massive strain. They've lost a lot of workers. They can't operate in the way that they used to because they have to do social distancing. Some of them can't allow people into shops. And uh, I have heard from uh, a few independent bike shops that there is a, often a lot of people coming are actually quite rude and arrogant. They don't uh, understand that bicycle maintenance does actually cost because people have to be paid to do it. Uh, they don't understand that bikes are a bit more expensive than what they remember from 40 years ago. And they're a bit overly demanding and a bit pushy. I think a lot of that is due to the fact that cycling has been traditionally seen as an inferior form of transport or not really a proper form of transport. So I, I would urge people who are... Maybe we'll leave this one for another conference, uh, discussion because yeah, yeah. otherwise... We'll, we'll, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I, think, okay. I, I think we can say to the organisers maybe... Um, the behaviour change, uh, capturing yes. the behaviour change of a long term. I think there's a suggestion there for a long, for another seminar. Yeah. On, on that, on that. Can I just suggest that people, can I, can I just suggest uh, people have a look at choosehowyoumove.co.uk, which is our website with Leicester County Council, um, where we promote our bike aid scheme, which is doing a lot of the stuff Bob's talking about. Yeah, because I, I, yeah, I think we should, you know, move on to some of the other questions. I mean, one of the couple of couple more specifically infrastructure related questions. Um, one of the questions that's come up is about, we talked about crossings earlier, but basically shifting from refuges to zebras. Um, but obviously they will need traffic orders. They'll need, they can't, you can't do a pop-up, well, can't legally do a pop-up zebra. Um, Brighton's scheme on the Ultram Road is significantly compromised by one refuge, but you couldn't take a refuge out overnight. Um, certainly not cost effectively. So what do people think about switching um, from informal refuge type crossings to, to the more formal zebra crossings? Um, I think this is probably another one for Adam actually. Uh, I mean we are, we're actually looking at informal crossings and some creative solutions working with um, a street art uh, organization at the moment so to, uh, absolutely we're looking at developing informal crossings and uh, you know and how we might do that um, and I think moving forward to to the formal kind of DFT zebra um, would be and the work that's been looking at, and also working looking at the work that's going on in Manchester with um with Brian Deegan and promoting pr promoting their crossings too so yeah absolutely um I think the uh, yeah I think just pr promoting desire lines um safe desire lines um whichever way you can yeah and Alex, just on, on, on that with regard yeah, to I, just ask Alex about his streetscape because you you refer, you related that particularly to green space and access so I think there's an element there of how people get to their low, in their low traffic neighbourhoods, is that something you've looked at, or is that something that you've just left to the detail? Yeah, I think I think what's really interesting about this current situation is sort of every city in 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 the UK and across the world are kind of running into these same challenges at the same time, and there is no um, guidance out there about how you put in a crossing overnight. So I'm I'm really um, interested to see the different solutions that cities are coming up with, what works, what doesn't work. I'm really interested actually in um, in Leicester's street art uh, solution to this. So um, I don't think I have uh, the answer um, on, on, on the top of my head about what, what's doing those situations. And I think like a lot of the sort of the innovative um, infrastructure measures we're going to see, it's going to be a case of um, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work and and, and what's, what great ideas are coming from around the country. But Bob, if you can answer yeah. briefly, but I want to get one more question in before the end, if, we, yeah. if I may. What, what I was going to say is it, it's the same principle with regard to pedestrian guard railing is that you're not just putting in things, you're taking out things. And one of the things that's been good to see, for example, in Greenwich is that when you do the footway extension, they've taken out the guard railing and you know the evidence of the, of, of the benefits of doing this from TfL. So that's a good thing to do. Thanks. Um, well, we've got about five minutes left and one question I did want to ask uh, is that monitoring and evaluation because um, officially from the DFT's point of view councils are expected to self-monitor and self-report um, to get the second tranche of their funding but um, I'm hoping and assuming that various people are going to be looking both at the data from pre-infrastructure but also the stuff they've been doing now so um, 
I, um, if I start maybe with Alex, because obviously TFL monitoring, you do a lot of it. But if you've all got anything to point out, and, and Jeanette as well, in terms of presumably you just know how much you put in. So that, that's <laughs> monitoring in its own way. Um, and I gather there's a, a particular event coming up, and I've just been told next week on monitoring. But if you could just briefly answer on, on how you're evaluating whether it works, that might be a better way of looking at it than detailed monitoring. Yeah, it's a really interesting question because obviously when I look at how many people are using the new pop-up cycle lanes, what's going on um, on high streets and town centres where we've expanded the footway space. Um, but the real question we're trying to answer isn't have we got as many people cycling as possible or have we got as many people walking as possible? It's are we getting the city functioning uh, safely um, as we come out of that lockdown? So um, part of our approach is uh, people who need to travel making sure they can cycle or walk they've always got that option but part of our approach is getting people to stagger their travel throughout the day continue to work from home um, where possible so um, it's kind of hard to answer the, the, the question would this trip have been made uh, by cycling or by car or by public transport or not at all um, if we put the cycle lane in or not so um, I think we'll, we'll see the standard sort of um, numbers that we generally collect on our schemes but I think, um, and again, this is something that all of us working on, on on this topic around the country are going to grapple with. I think the actual um, research question for the monitoring um, is going to be quite a challenge one to answer um, fully. I think the academics are going to have a lovely time dealing with all the data from all of this. Um, Adam, have you got any views on, on, on public acceptance? I know in Brighton that the Ultra and Road scheme's got something like 90%, the councils are saying 90% of the answers they're getting, responses they're getting are supportive, which they said is amazing. I mean, are you getting, what sort of feedback are you getting? It's just in terms of, uh, yeah, kind of qualitative stuff, yeah, I'd say probably 90% um, is, is about right. There are always um, concerns, and I think we're moving at such a pace that those concerns are often ill-founded. I've just, while you've been talking, I've been responding to an email some of, of uh, one of our, complaining of our footway widening on Belgrave Road on our Golden Mile in the north of the city um, has caused a traffic tailback last night. We, we've just confirmed there was a road traffic accident that would have caused a tailback, whatever the situation mm -hmm. was, where we widened the footway. Um, so, yeah, and so we're, off, we're often able to, to push back any uh, well, we are able, we've been able to push back any of those concerns that have come forward with reasonable um, reasonings. Uh, but we're also doing a lot of monitoring. Um, we're also looking at longer, more longitudinal studies uh, as well, um, moving out of lockdown and, and kind of the COVID-19 impact on, on traffic and, and air quality, which we haven't really touched on in, in any great detail either. So looking at both counts and um, nitrogen dioxide um, and um, PM2.5 um, impacts as well will really help us to to evaluate holistically um, the impact of the of the measures we're taking. Um, and the other two, have you got any any thoughts on monitoring and issues? Uh, for for our point of view, um, obviously we we try and keep tabs of where all these products are going. Um, but for us, it's more of a case of is what has been implemented is it working? Is it achieving? Mm what the solution what the you know what the proposal is are we creating enough space is it is it creating enough you know usage for what what's there so we look at it in a different way um in terms of that but we obviously liaise very closely with our customers and with our partners just to make sure that it is working and the beauty about the product is that if it needs adjusting you can easily just uplift it, move it, and tweak it, and then put it back. So you you do have that flexibility. So in in that terms, it, that's how we would sort of look at it. Uh, and Bob, have you? Yeah, you're consulting in situ. Sorry, oh, sorry, Adam. I mean, if Bob can answer, and then I'll come back to you, Adam, at the end. Thanks. Yeah, I mean the monitoring thing is basically: uh, Are you getting more people out there walking and cycling? And uh, there are various counts. I mean, you know, this is a time when all the data people are trying to get loads and loads of data out and uh, you know you have to look at more walking and cycling you have to look at overall traffic flows uh, of course it's all complicated don't rest on your laurels because we don't know what's going to happen in terms of employment and how many commuter journeys are going to be made it, it, it's still all up in the air so this is a time when we really have to plug ahead with what's been talked about today uh, Adam, I think you had one last comment, and I think we've got to wind so, up. I was only agreeing with Jeanette that the beauty of this is the flexibility um, that we have, and we're able to be fleet of foot around what we're doing and learn by doing, um, obviously maintaining safety. 
Well, I think that's uh, I think that's it for now. I'm, I'm sure we could carry on talking, and I think the, the presentations are going to be made available to everyone. Um, and all questions answers will be responded to afterwards, I'm told. So I think some, one of us is going to have to sit down and work that out. So that's that's great, and it only th remains to be say thank you to everyone, to, to Adam, who we couldn't see, but I'm sure is sitting in sunny Leicester, Alex in London, J Jeanette. I don't know where you are, Jeanette, but in Alton, I'm that's assuming. It. Yeah, Alton, yeah. Um, and, and Bob in West London and myself down in Brighton and I'll, I'll leave you with the, the slogan from Brighton, the Brighton Tourist Board, which is don't visit Brighton, but we will love to have you coming back here at some time in the future. And I'm sure um, Landa will love you to come back to some of the future sessions in the, in the near future next week, in fact. So thanks very much to everyone. And thanks to all the uh, I don't know how many people came uh, uh, well over 100, up to 150, I think, at one point. So thanks to everyone. And thanks again. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.